We are going to delve right into our Revelation study. The kids are actually going to be studying Revelation parallels with what we're doing. So Miss Julie and uh, Sienna and Kayana are going to take the kids back. So uh, we'll do that as I pray for you and for our adult session here. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would come tonight, that you would meet with us in a special way, that you would teach us your word, that you would strengthen us, you would cause us to have a deep understanding of what you are doing in context of the end times. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to be able to receive from you, from the youngest one here to the oldest. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. I promised you tonight we are delving into the section uh, that begins the judgment of God on wickedness. And I want to stress to you that it is his judgments on wickedness, it is not his judgments on his people. If you need the handout, you didn't receive it tonight, it's on the back <coughs> table there. Session 8 is where we are at. Uh, a brief review and overview of what we've talked about so far, and I want you to get the big picture in this first slide, slide here. We talked last week about Revelation chapter 5, where Jesus takes the scroll out of the Father's hand. And with that, he's declaring that he's taking responsibility to enact the plan of God to bring about the full restoration of all things, making all things new. And here's the big picture of what takes place. Jesus, he earned the right, he earned the right to rule the earth. Remember we talked last time about how Adam was given dominion. Mankind, with Adam being the representative, was given dominion over the earth. God said so in Genesis chapter 1, and he will not go back on his word. He said mankind has been given the dominion over everything that is in the earth and on the earth itself. And so man, when they sinned, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they handed over temporarily the dominion of the planet to Satan. In fact, you remember we talked about, we referenced when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, Satan came to him and he said, I will give you everything that has been given to me if you will bow the knee to me. He references that dominion was handed to him. Uh, it was by deception that he received it. Well, Jesus earned the right to rule the earth because he followed in obedience to the Father's plan, became a man, became human, fully God, always, for all eternity, has existed from the beginning, will exist all the way through the end. There is no timeline for God. He is fully God. But at this particular instance, in history, about 2,000 years ago, he chose to follow God the Father's plan and become fully human as well. So he earned the right to rule the earth, yet gives it to the Father because Jesus delights in humility. Here's an amazing thing. Remember how we talked about last week that the God the Father is exalting Jesus. His name is above every name, right? We talked about how that actually is a step down for Jesus because he left his glory to come and become fully human. Uh, it's a step down for God to do that. But his name, God the Father, has exalted him to the highest place that could possibly be given to any human being. Jesus, his name is above every other name. And so he comes, Jesus comes, uh, at the end, in the Millennium Kingdom, we talked about the Millennium Kingdom is the time that it takes to restore the planet from all the judgments that have happened to make it ready for the presence of the Father to come to earth and reside on earth. Scripture says there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and what's happening there is the physical realm is being joined with the spiritual realm for all of eternity. So, um, then comes the end, the millennial kingdom, when he, Jesus, delivers the kingdom. This is 1 Corinthians 15. He delivers the kingdom to God the Father when he, Jesus, puts an end to all rule, which is the hostile and evil authorities during the millennium. Now, when all things are made subject to him, Jesus, then the Son himself will also be subject to him, the Father. 
that God may be all in all. Amazing passage of scripture. We read over 1 Corinthians 15 and we oftentimes just don't have the context for what is going on here. But Jesus is literally going to hand over uh, his authority and his dominion that he has received with the honor that God the Father has bestowed on him. He's going to hand that over to the Father and for all eternity God the Father will reside with mankind here on this planet. Uh, I want you to understand that. A lot of people... They uh, talk about uh, the end of the world. The world is never going to end. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. I mean, there's a hymn that we sing, World without end, amen, amen, right? Uh, it's actually true. The world will never end. God created this to exist for all eternity. There's going to be a new heaven. He's going to make it new and a new earth because the physical and the spiritual are coming together. But this little ball of dirt is uh, ordained by God for eternity. Uh, okay, so I'm going to get massively sidetracked if I don't delve into the notes now, right? So, hang on with me. We've got like 40 slides to go through tonight. Amen to that. Amen. Thank you. All right, very good. So, paragraph A. Jesus took the scroll, sealed with seven seals from the hand of the Father. It represents... The title deed, you'll notice that I've put some blanks in there for you, because last week some of you were falling asleep. So this week you have to uh, actually fill in the blanks, so make sure you've got a pen or pencil to write in. So uh, it represents the title deed of the earth and the action plan required to cleanse the earth. See, what Jesus is doing is he is going to literally and physically drive evil off this planet. But it's a, a plan that has to be enacted. And we're going to learn about this plan tonight and why he is doing it the way he's doing it. Jesus will open each seal to release a terrifying judgment against the wicked. So we have Revelations 5, 7 and 9 that says he... Uh, Jesus came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him, the Father, and they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. When it says he is worthy to open the seals, what it is talking about is he is worthy to release the judgments of God to bring about this cleansing of the earth, this restoration of all things. Paragraph B, the seven seals are literal. I want you to believe that tonight. These are not symbolic things that are described in Scripture. When it talks about a great earthquake, guess what? There's going to be a great earthquake. Uh, these are literal events that are taking place. There are some things that are described to us that we are to understand uh, the implications thereof. But these are literal events, literal seals that are being opened. They are future uh, at this point, still future in their fulfillment. And they are also progressive in intensity. So seal one comes before which seal? Two. Two comes before which seal? Three. He's not going to open seal seven first. Right? He's going to go through the seals. And they increase in intensity. So where is seal? And you have to think of it this way. We've got, how many, what types of judgments are there? There's the seal judgments. What comes after that? The trumpets. The trumpet judgments, and then come the bowls. The bowls. Now, if you think of it, uh, in the natural, God always uses specific things because he's communicating something specific to us. If you have a seal that you open, that seal remains open, and the effects of that continue to uh, affect whatever the seal is doing. So we are meant to understand that as seal one is opened, the effects of that don't go away for quite some time. Whereas with the trumpets and then with the bowls, there is a more rapid succession of things that are taking place. So with the trumpets, if you hear a trumpet blast, uh, it, it rings in the ears for a little bit. Uh, if you have a bowl, uh, Seth, uh, Seth likes to do this, my, my little baby, uh, he likes to, he's just now high enough that he can reach the kitchen table. And whatever is in his reach, he will inevitably dump on the floor. And it's a very quick thing that happens. In fact, we have to race to it to stop it, right? So the trumpet blast lingers in your ear for a bit, but the bowl is a very rapid thing. And I believe the bowl judgments are actually taking place 
during the second coming procession of Jesus. And we'll talk about that when we get there. So the seals are meant to be understood <laughs> as literal, as yet future from our perspective today, progressive in intensity, and they are numbered. They're released in a sequential order. Uh, paragraph C, one's view of the timing in which Jesus will open the seals is one interpretive key to revelation. I believe Jesus has not yet opened the first seal, and here's why. Because it tells us in chapter 5 that the bowls of incense were full. The prayer movement is in maturity when this is taking place. Now, uh, it's interesting to me that we're looking at current events and we're seeing all these things that are going crazy in the world and they're increasing in rapid succession. Even this morning, there were again some police officers killed and we had just prayed about that. Uh, there, there's just such a rapid succession of things that are taking place. Uh, it needs to draw us as the church into prayer. That's why we took time to uh, talk about and to teach prayer this morning. Because this is what our heart response needs to become. As we see these things take place, we need to be drawn into the place of prayer. Because scripture prophesies, Revelation 5, 8, when he, Jesus, had taken the scroll, the 24 elders, they fell down, and they each had two things. They had a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now the harp represents the worship movement on earth, and the bowls represent the prayer movement on earth. Uh, if, you, if you've been alive as long as I have, you have seen a revival take place in the worship movement of the world. There's a hunger for depth in our worship music. It started off with kind of these little choruses that, you know, repeat the same line 500 times and usually end with love. But, uh, you know, it started with that, but then it started going into a hunger for more, a hunger for depth that is being communicated. I mean, that hymn that Josh played uh, this, this evening, how much depth there is to that and, and the, uh, the amazing thing that is being communicated to us. In fact, it's kind of an outline of what we're talking about. That hymn is perfect. Uh, so th there's a revival of the worship movement that is taking place, and this is not by accident. This is ordained by God as also is the prayer movement. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the missions uh, leaders around the world, main mission agencies, uh, they have projected and their goal is to see hundreds of thousands of prayer ministries started throughout the globe in the next 20 years. Hundreds of thousands of prayer movements. And it is a growing thing, and it's because the Spirit is doing this. So the bowls of prayer must be full, uh, and uh, because they are full when he opens the seal. Paragraph D. In the generation in which the Lord returns, God will shake all nations to judge the kingdom of darkness, to purify the church, and bring in the great harvest, including the salvation of Israel. These are amazing things that are taking place. If you think about this, in seven years, God is going to accomplish the most profound things. I mean, just think about purifying the church. That's profound. That's what he's going for. Scripture tells us that he is after an equally yoked bride that is functioning under the leadership of the Holy Spirit as Jesus functions under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That's what his desire is. That's what he's uh, preparing us for. That's how he is trying to remove dirt out of our life. And uh, we need to understand that's where this thing is going, is a purified church is what he desires to do. I want you to briefly hop over with me to, um, uh, actually I'll, I'll read the Haggai passage first, then uh, get ready for Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, here's what it says about the shaking that God is going to do. It's, it's this process that he is using to uh, prepare the earth for what is to come. In Haggai 2 verses 6 and 7 he says, I will shake heaven and earth the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they, the unbelievers, shall come to the desire of all nations. Think about this for a minute. When God the Father was thinking about 
What term to use to describe the Messiah in context of the end times? He used the term the desire of the nations. God's plan in all of this, in the end times things, in, in pouring out judgment, his goal is for people to desire Jesus. That's an amazing statement right there. I mean, there's, there's all of these judgments taking place in massive severity. But the way he is doing it is going to produce a heart response from the greatest number of people that this planet has ever seen come to Jesus. It's an, an amazing thing that he's declaring here. They will come to the desire of all nations as he is shaking heaven and earth. So think about this. God will shake all nations. There is a political shaking as well as a physical shaking. It says he will shake the heavens. Think of the sky being shaken. We've got a bunch of judgments that come that are uh, uncontrollable from man's perspective because they come from the sky. They are heavenly judgments that we can't prevent. No matter what Hollywood says, you're not going to be able to send a spaceship into space to stop the judgments of God. Right? Have you ever seen those movies? Judgments coming and spaceships stop them somehow miraculously. Not going to happen, okay? God is not able to be stopped in this. He has a purpose. Uh, it says he's going to shake the earth, the dry land. He's going to shake the sea. Uh, think about the tsunamis that have been in recent years. Uh, he's going to use earthquakes. Uh, he will shake the political institutions. And all throughout the shaking, unbelievers in the nations... They are going to come to the desire of all nations. Hebrews 12, verse 25 through 29. Here's what it says. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. I, I love that. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. Speaking of the Holy Spirit who speaks to our hearts. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, Jesus, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. That's an important thing to understand. There are things that can be shaken, and there are things that cannot be shaken. Everything that is done in righteousness, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, cannot be shaken. Now, I say that for a very specific purpose. Anything that we do as the body of Christ in righteousness, even, even going so far as saying, enacting laws. Remember, our identity as the church is the governmental assembly of Jesus here on earth. That's who we are. That is the ecclesia. I say that over and over again so that you get that in your head. You are mighty in God. To tear down what? Strongholds. Jesus is going to let righteousness and sin come to maturity. I want you to hear that. He's going to let righteousness and sin come to maturity. There are some examples in scripture that I want to briefly highlight so that you understand what is going on here. In Genesis chapter 6, we have... Noah and the account of what happened there and why God had to bring judgment. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is a shocking statement. Every intent of the heart continually was evil. God had to bring judgment on that. Another principle that we see in scripture is Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, where God is making the covenant with Abram. 
And he says in verse 16, chapter 15, he's talking about what's going to happen to the people of Israel before they are allowed to possess the land that God is giving them. He says, as for you, verse 15, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age, so giving assurance to Abraham. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And before that, verse 13, he prophesies uh, to Abraham and says, for 400 years, your descendants are going to live in exile. And the reason is because I am waiting for sin to come to maturity in the nation of the Amorites. God is a very patient God, a very loving God. And He waits for people to turn to Him. But in, if you imagine a cup that is being filled with sin, there is a point where that cup is full. And when that cup is full, repentance cannot <coughs> take place anymore. And God has to bring judgment. It's exactly what happened in the days of Noah. God shut the door on Noah and his family, essentially condemning wickedness because every intent of the heart was evil continually, we're told. The door was open for a long time, but then it was shut and judgment was brought in severity. Uh, Jesus himself in Matthew 24, he tells us a few things about the context of the end times. And he tells us specifically that it's going to be as in the days of Noah. And this is even talking still about the beginnings. We'll see the king in his beauty. I want you to recognize that if you draw near to God, you will see God in his beauty. Your heart will meditate on terror. Where is the scribe? Where is he who weighs? Where is he who counts the towers? Isaiah is saying here, if you come and see, as the angel talks to John, if you have a heart to come close to God, then you will see these judgments in the right perspective. You will see what God is trying to accomplish here. You will recognize this is 100% just 100% loving, 100% righteous, 100% holy. Everything God does, He does in His character, in who He is. He never denies any aspect of who He is. And we need to understand that. So we come and see, we're called to do that, we're called to draw close to God. It's kind of the same idea as the watch and pray that Jesus mentioned over and over again. Paragraph H. There's a principle of judgment. I've, I've mentioned this uh, statement before. I, I think it just captures so well the heart of God. He will use the least severe means, the least severe means, to reach the greatest number of people at the deepest level of love without violating anyone's free will. That's an amazing thing that God can do here. God is going to remove everything that hinders His love from going deep into people. So He removes things from the church that hinder love. He, We call that discipline, divine discipline. He removes things from society that hinder love. And His judgment is progressive on these different things that he is needing to deal with in his divine wisdom. If you think about it, what God is essentially saying is, I could not lessen the severity of what I'm doing and still accomplish everything on all the levels that it needs to be accomplished. He doesn't need to increase it. It's, it's the perfect measure of what needs to be done in order to accomplish this. Paragraph I. God's judgments against the wicked in the first four seals result from God taking his restraining hand off evil men, allowing them to sin in an unrestrained way against one another. The Antichrist will act violently against the nations, including the harlot Babylon. 
And that's a lot of stuff packed into one paragraph there. Let me break it down for you. In, uh, I'm trying to see where I wrote down the reference here. I think it was 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. And it was chapter 2. Starting with verse 5. Uh, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. So there's a something and a someone that is currently restraining the wickedness in the heart of man. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So God right now, he is restraining evil in the world. He is restraining uh, the influence, uh, I mean, if you think about it, if God were not restraining evil and wickedness in the world, none of us would want to be here. But, there is coming a point in, in history here, when we get to these seals, where God in His divine wisdom is going to remove that restraint. And man's heart is going to be allowed to enter into maturity in wickedness. It's a terrifying thing to think about. I mean, we, we have some pockets of examples of wickedness in the world. We've seen it on TV, we've seen the movies, we've seen the news reports. But on a global scale, when God removes that restraint, wickedness will be allowed to come to fullness just as holiness will be allowed to come to fullness and righteousness. You need to understand that there is, there is a parallel going on here. The great harvest is coming in, right? The great harvest. I mean, there are going to be billions of people that will come into the household of faith. It's a great harvest. It's not this little uh, revival over in this city. No, it's a global thing that is taking place, and God is going to do that uh, by using these judgments. The first four seals are brought about by the actions of sinful men. As we talk through each one of these, you'll see that. The first four, God is lifting his hand and he's letting men uh, do this. These actions are sinful, uh, showing sinful humanity. The fifth seal and, and the sixth and the seventh seal, they involve supernatural action from heaven. We'll see those. There. It's a different dimension that is taking place there. Paragraph J. Each seal naturally leads to the unfolding of the next seal. For example, the release of the Antichrist is in the first seal, leads to a world war in the second seal, which in turn causes famine and economic crisis in the third seal, followed by death and disease. So there's an intensity uh, of this trauma that takes place, this pressure that increases with each seal. So the first seal, let's take a look at that. It's uh, Antichrist's political aggression. The opening of the first seal speaks of the Antichrist's political aggression. Verse 1 and 2, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, Come and see. I looked, and behold, there was a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So, one of the four living creatures again says, you need to come close to God now, you need to get the right perspective. There is someone who is going to be revealed, he is sitting on a horse, he has a bow in his hand, he has a crown that is given to him, and he's going out conquering, and to conquer. The white is an important symbol in scripture. White talks about righteousness in scripture. Righteousness is something that can only come from God. 
Righteousness is, uh, we are clothed as believers, we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. The white horse here is symbolizing righteousness, but it is a counterfeit righteousness because it is Satan imitating what Jesus is. See, Antichrist, he is termed that because he is a counterfeit Christ. So everything Satan does is a counterfeit of the real thing. Satan cannot create anything. He can only copy things. And he can only do a bad job copying it. So this white horse that he is on symbolizes a perceived righteousness from this man, the Antichrist. He's going to come in deceiving the nations. He, it says he is given... He has a bow and he's given a crown. Well, the bow, if you notice, it's an arrowless bow. Paragraph C. It's an arrowless bow. Uh, he is accomplishing his victories bloodless. The best example that we have, the best contemporary example, well, contemporary if you're 100 years old, I guess, but uh, Adolf Hitler, when he came to power, a lot of what he did was quote, peaceful. He had dealings going on behind the scenes and he was allowed to march into nations, take control of nations. I mean, Austria, where I grew up, was literally, he just walked in and took over. And later, people found out how he did it, basically, he gunned to people's head. I do this or else. But he was able to march into multiple nations and take it over without one shot ever being fired. This is what the Antichrist is going to do. The world is going to look at him and they're going to see a peaceful man. One who is able to bridge the gap. One who is able to bring peace to the, the nations that are in such turmoil. But you have to remember, as the world is crying out peace and safety, in Thessalonians, Paul tells us, then sudden destruction comes. And that's actually what takes place between seal 1 and seal 2. So this bow that he carries is an arrowless bow, but it is a weapon of war either way. He is, uh, uh, this, this bow actually speaks of being able to strike at a distance, but there's no arrows, so it's the threat of war, uh, not the actual war that is yet breaking out, that will come in the next seal. So the crown that is given to him speaks of his political authority. Uh, once you to understand, that God is the one who is giving him authority. You need to understand this because we do not want to have an offended heart when these things take place. Jesus said, blessed is he who is not offended by what I do. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 18, Great Commission starts with what? The first word is all. All power and authority has been given to who? So, nobody is allowed to have authority except if Jesus allows them to have it. For a time, three and a half years, for a time, the Antichrist is allowed to have authority, which is symbolized by this crown. It will be a limited sphere of authority, but for three and a half years, he is granted that. Um, we have in Revelation 13, listed the same thing, verse 7, an authority was given him, the Antichrist, over every nation. In Matthew 28, again, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Uh, Romans 13, there is no authority except from God. The authorities that exist are appointed by God. He is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So, Yes, there is an aspect, obviously, Satan and sinful leaders will also give their authority to the Antichrist, but it happens under what Jesus allows to take place for his purposes. If you look at paragraph E, you'll see one of his purposes. Through the Antichrist, God actually is going to bring judgment on the harlot Babylon religion for murdering the saints. So that one of the seals... Uh, that we're going to get to is uh, uh, the the saints are actually being martyred. It's not that's not the judgment. Uh, they're being martyred. The judgment is the prayer, the incense, the bowls of incense, the prayer movement is being fueled by this martyrdom, 
and there is an amazing outpouring of God's judgment because of the increase in prayer. Um, so that's actually the judgment that takes place. We read over it and we're like, but you said that the church isn't getting judged and seal number five is about the church. No, it, it's not. Uh, the church is not getting judged. The church is being purified. Okay? Being purified is very different. We get a spanking sometimes because we're not pure. All right? But we need to understand what's actually happening is the, the heart of God is being riled up. Remember, he's ravished with love for us. And when his people are being attacked, he will respond. Okay, uh, Roman numeral 3, the second seal is world war. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, again, come and see, draw near to God, understand what's going on from the perspective of what God is doing. And the second seal was a horse which was fiery red in color, went out. It was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So now he is receiving the weapon with which he is going to make war. Uh, the, this is uh, the final world war in history. Now if, if, uh, if this thing plays out as we've been talking about with the, the birth pains increasing and, and all these things, uh, this could very well be the only world war left. If Jesus waits a while, there might be another world war before then. But the one that is described here in, second, in the second seal is the final world war that will take place. Because after that, Jesus is going to be uh, here ruling and reigning. And there will not be another world war. He was given a great sword. This sword speaks of extreme forms of bloodshed. Uh, it's, it's war and violence that is taking place. He is granted to take peace from the earth. The context for the breaking of the seals is the counterfeit world peace which is taking place under the first seal. Peace and safety is what the people are calling out. And he is granted to take that peace away. Uh, as that seal is broken, it ends... Uh, the peace and safety and sudden destruction comes in as it says in 1 Thessalonians 